I've been fully committed to the environmental space for over 15 years, working in aluminium recycling and renewable energy, and investing into sustainable environmental infrastructure. A couple of years ago, I was rooting around in my pockets, and I found this coin. It's a, it's a bicentennial special edition two-pound coin that celebrates Britain's abolition of the uh, slave trade. Now, I was shocked to realize I knew absolutely nothing about Britain's slave history. And I talked to some friends, some who had history degrees, and they knew virtually nothing as well. When I thought of slavery, I imagined the cotton plantations in the deep south of America. I thought of movies like 12 Years a Slave or Gone with the Wind. I thought, I need to learn something about this. The inquisitiveness built in me, and I started researching. And what I learned, I believe, is a little-known moral history that deserves to be told in its own right, but importantly, gives us important insights and um, uh, a way of thinking about climate change and how we can tackle it. So I'd like to, first of all, take you through my perspective of the abolition of slavery within Britain, and then explicitly take you through where I see the parallels. Now, first of all, a word of note. I'm not a historian. I'm an engineer, and I'm also an economist. So I hope the parallels, the moral parallels, and the economic parallels will soon become clear to you. Let's start the story in 1787 with a society with the establishment of the Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Not the catchiest name, I grant you, but nonetheless pretty clear about what it's setting out to do. And this society published the following year in 1788 that image, which viscerally shows the inhumane and cramped conditions that slaves were transported on ships from Africa to the Caribbean sugar plantations. It was that image that is often said to be the starting pistol of the abolitionist movement. And it was that image that cemented uh, the slave issue within the British conscience and the political arena at the time. Between, between 1789 and, 2000, and sorry, 1805, many attempts were made, driven by the campaigners, to get Parliament to pass acts to abolish the trade in slaves. They were all continually thwarted, um, and the efforts of this man, William Wilberforce, were shut down in Parliament by the lobbying of the slave owners and the sugar plantation owners. Finally, however, in 1807, the abolition of the Slave Trade Act was passed. But it was not the simple moral victory that this coin, this bicentennial celebration, would make you think. Around that time, the British plantation owners were feeling the effects of the Dutch and Brazilian plantations that were beginning to grow at the time. The plantation owners thought if they could abolish the trade in slaves, they would prevent the new competition from uh, developing and competing with them and therefore maintaining their condition. And they felt that they'd have their own self-perpetuating workforce um, from the children of their own slaves that would keep going and keep operating. If we go forward eight years to the Congress of Vienna, where the major European nations all met following the defeat of Napoleon to lay out the long-term peace of Europe, again, the campaigners forced the British government to take to the table that all those European nations should condemn sorry, should condemn slavery, uh, the, uh, and that was indeed passed. It was the beginning of the international movement for the abolition of the trade in slaves. At the same time, the British government agreed to pay the Portuguese and Spanish governments compensation for agreeing to abolish their own trade in slaves. And this is important. At this point, this was just the trade in slaves and not slavery itself. <clears throat> 
If we go forward another eight years to 1823, we saw the regrouping of the abolitionist movement. There were the gradual abolitionists pushing for the gradual change and the abolition of slavery, and the more radical abolitionists who pushed for the immediate abolition of slavery. Now, government's response at this time was to regulate and reform slavery, to try and make the conditions in the plantations more bearable, to monitor the, the performance and behavior of the uh, plantation owners. Around this time, slave rebellions started to occur throughout the Caribbean, from the slave rebellion that turned into a declaration of independence in Haiti, to rebellions in Barbados and Demerara. Finally, in 1831 and 32, sorry, this culminated in a very large and ferocious slave revolt in Jamaica, with a huge loss of life and a significant economic impact. These exogenous events forced both the government and the slave, owner, and, and the slave owners to realize that the abolition of slavery was a pressing necessity and could be delayed no more. So two years later, in 1833, the Abolition of Slavery Act was passed by British Parliament. Now, it's worth taking a few minutes to look at what happened behind this agreement. And I'd like to thank University College London's British uh, Legacies of Slave Ownership Project, who provided a lot of input here. Now, you may have thought that the plantation owners were far away in the Caribbean, but in fact, it's estimated that one-fifth of all Britain's wealthy had significant financial ties to slavery at this time. Indeed, within two miles of this building, it's estimated there were over 600 slave owners at the time benefiting from slavery in the faraway dominions. So they were a very powerful lobby at this time. And the British government, in order to pass this act, had to negotiate with the slave owners, and the abolitionists who built up a very strong campaign strategy. After much horse trading, with numbers between zero and 100 million mentioned, finally the British government agreed to pay 20 million pounds, around 16 billion today, paid as compensation to the slave owners. Depressingly, by today's standard, it was never thought of paying compensation to the slaves themselves. That was a huge number, 5% of UK GDP at the time, or equivalent to 40% of the government's annual expenditure. The calculation of this number, or the allocation of number, is interesting. It's thought to be one of the very first times that the British government, the British Treasury, undertook detailed statistical analysis. What it did is it listed every single one of those 800,000 slaves, by age, sex, skill level, health, on which plantation and the productivity, and it ascribed a market value to each and every slave. And then each slave owner was paid compensation based upon the value of that slave. And around about that 20 million was equivalent to 45% of the market value of a slave was paid as compensation. To get the deal through, it was agreed that the slaves had to work a six-year apprenticeship uh, in order to, if you like, play with that cake. And finally, there was an agreed 20% loss that the slave owners would have to face as a result of this deal. I just want you to look at that for a moment, because I'm going to refer to that when we talk about climate change in a few minutes. Now, was that a good deal? Was that compensation payment a good deal? Can you put a price on human suffering? This was first and foremost a moral act, but it also had economic consequences. If we compare the orderly compensation payment to achieve abolition within Britain with what happened in the US 30 years later with the US Civil War, and we compare the cost of the damage to property and lost productivity in the Civil War, that turns out to be between 12 and 18 times more expensive than the compensation that was agreed within Britain. Not only that, the compensation payment 
brought about not only a moral double emancipation, as Thomas Huxley here mentions, but also an economic emancipation. At this time, the compensation payment was put into the investing classes and was a large fiscal event. Those monies went through the investing classes and were invested in railways, technologies, new factories. And there's evidence that suggests that it helped turbocharge Britain's industrial revolution at the time, putting Britain's development and wealth way above that of its competitors. So what does that story tell us about climate change? For me, the image of the Brooks slave ship can be seen in the images of CO2 increasing in the atmosphere, of increasing global temperatures that we're experiencing every day. They can be seen in the photos of pollution. They can be seen in the receding photos, sorry, the photos of the receding glaciers. William Wilberforce's words are echoed today by the most progressive leaders around the world. We're also seeing campaign strategies built very much on the kind of campaign strategies that the abolitionists invented 200 years ago. In the same way that we saw the multiple attempts in Parliament, and we saw the Congress of Vienna, we've seen over the last four years many attempts by the world and its bodies to move forward the climate change agenda. From Stockholm in 72, to Rio in 92, and most recently to Paris in 2015. However, it seems like then, what we've tried to do is encourage the reduction in pollution. It seems like then, what we've tried to do is regulate down the emissions of greenhouse gases. It seems like then that we have been constrained and manipulated by vested interests, the oil lobby, the coal lobby, the international shipping industry. It seems to me that we haven't necessarily moved beyond what was the abolition in the trade in slaves, where indeed what we need to do is look forward to the complete equivalent of the abolition of slavery. So, what does the past tell us about the future? In the same way that the slave rebellions accelerated all parties to come to a decision to fully abolish slavery. Mother Nature is rebelling from all of the CO2 that we're pumping into the atmosphere. And what we're seeing is increasing numbers of, significant, of, of weather events, of losses worldwide related to storms, uh, fires, etc. Indeed, the governor of the Bank of England has identified that climate change can pose a significant risk to global financial security. So what can we predict about the future? Well, perhaps, like the ferocious slave rebellion in Jamaica, finally forcing people over the line, perhaps what we'll see is a major weather-related catastrophe, a major climate-induced financial shock in the markets will push governments and financial markets to make the final move to abolishing, or coming to the equivalent of abolishing slavery. So what is today's equivalent? The world is a very complicated place, much more complicated than Britain in 1833. However, the concept of that pie chart of loss and compensation, I think, is very insightful. The good news is the world is moving in the right direction. Governments, businesses, technology, financial markets, the public are beginning to get on this bandwagon. Indeed, it seems like we've already made the decision, the equivalent decision to the six years of indentured slavery or indentured apprenticeship that the slaves had to take. That's our 2% threshold uh, that we don't want the climate to go above. But the, the tricky part is what we now do with compensation and loss. We've got to find $90 trillion to sustainably invest over the next 15 years to build this infrastructure. That is a huge number. 
What we need governments to do, as then, is to step up, lead through legislation, lead through rules, and also lead, importantly, through public funding. We ourselves, through our pension funds and the wealth that has been accumulated, need to invest and play our bit in the sustainable infrastructure. We need to price carbon properly. We need to tax carbon effectively. The polluters need to take their loss. And finally, and unpalatably for some, is we probably need to pay compensation to some of the world's polluters, to take those polluting assets out and allow the new sustainable technologies to take their place. If we fail to do that, if we fail to act boldly and act soon, then, like the US Civil War, we face the prospect of paying an extremely heavy price. Weather-related losses will continue to rise. Productivity will come down through drought, famine, and medical issues. And the chances and cost of military conflict around the world will increase as these effects will start to put pressure on nation states. If, however, we take lessons from history, if we can continue to cajole and campaign for our governments and ourselves and our businesses to be bold, then we have the tantalizing prospect of ourselves achieving a double carbon emancipation. Not only will we preserve this extraordinary planet for our fellow humans and for our future generations, but we will also unshackle ourselves from our reliance upon carbon and fossil fuels. If we can find the mechanisms to unlock the $90 trillion of investment into sustainable infrastructure, we have the prospect of seeing that investment deliver not only an attractive return to us through the savings and the efficiencies that it will drive, but more importantly, it will drive our global economy into a new, sustainable, and prosperous industrial revolution. Thank you very much.